coming from from Boston, so far away. Being here, sorry that everything is in Spanish, so I think I'm not hearing anything, I'm not hearing anything. But yeah, Spanish and all. But so, excuse me, I'm sorry. And now we want to listen to you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for inviting me. I'm thrilled. This is my first trip to to Spain, to Madrid, and it's been a place that's been on our uh, wish list to come to. So my wife actually came over with me. So after I do a couple days of business, uh, my wife and I are going to have a chance to really enjoy the city uh, over the weekend before we go back to Boston. Um, so again, thank you to the, the Neural One folks for inviting me and the Martin and Duretto folks for having me here. And uh, I'll apologize that I have to deliver my speech in English. Um, uh, having flown overnight from Boston, I probably will have enough trouble with English without trying to do it in Spanish. Um, but I'm really glad that you're all here because I think this is a really important development uh, that's taking place in marketing, this idea of bringing data and analytics to measurement. And it fits very well with Forrester's mantra uh, and our real slogan about challenge thinking lead change. We know we live in a time of tremendous change, fast moving change. And in order to take advantage of that change, uh, we have to challenge the way things have been done in our companies, and that's not easy sometimes. Um, and somebody has to be that leader. Someone has to be the person who decides this is an important thing my company needs to do. And by coming here today uh, and hearing what Cesar and Juan and Elena have talked about and Nacho have talked about, you've got a really good foundation for educating your companies and leading that chain. So what I want to do today um, is wrap up um, a lot of what you've heard, um, reinforce some of the great information. I could understand enough and pick up enough to know that uh, you've gotten both a really good overview of what attribution is from Nacho and then from uh, fellow marketers You've heard a lot about how to implement and use uh, these tools to improve your marketing. So let me sort of wrap all of that up. And uh, I want to reassure you, this isn't as hard as it may be it looks. It, it, it could be a little bit, seem a little bit daunting. Um, but I want to reassure you that it is something that you can do, and uh, you can be that leader. To do that, um, I actually want to take us on a little trip. Actually, not so little a trip. Does anybody recognize this spacecraft? This was the Rosetta mission launched by the European Space Agency that landed uh, that probe down there on a comet with a long Russian name I can't pronounce. I won't try. Um, but the story here is that that spacecraft was launched in 2004. It traveled billions and billions of kilometers around the solar system before it rendezvoused with that comet, landed that little lander, it's about the size of a washing machine, on the speck of dust that's the size of a few football fields. After a 10-year journey and billions of kilometers. Now that's precision target, right? But that's also a great symbol of what technology can do. And if technology can do that, surely technology can make marketing more measurable. And I will reach, you don't have to be a rocket scientist in order to do this. You don't even have to be a data scientist. So uh, again, probably you know, reiterating some of the things that, that you've heard, but I'll talk about, uh, about this and lead you into uh, some practical advice on how to get started about how you know measurements just getting harder and harder. Um, I'll give you my perspective on these tools that we've talked about this morning and show you some results that I've uh, found in my research. Um, first, maybe not familiar here in Europe, uh, this gentleman is, is much quoted uh, in America. His name is John Wanamaker. He was founder of department stores uh, in America uh, 100, more than 100 years ago, and his famous saying 
half the money I spend on advertising is wasted. The trouble is, I don't know which half. Um, still repeated, still a problem, and it's only getting worse. Uh, with the addition of all the new media channels and touch points that we've seen over the last few years. You know, John Wanamaker was uh, lamenting that and complaining about that when pretty much the only advertising he did was in newspapers. And now imagine the, the, how much harder it is with all of these different channels. And as we know, consumers uh, use all these different tools, different devices, you know, social media, mobile, web, search, they use all those things, you know, without even thinking about it. And we as marketers, the way we think about them as separate channels, is just completely out of touch with the way our consumers are using that. So we need a tool that helps us see how they work together the way that consumers work together. And then we get new experiences coming out, like this ability to watch a television program on your mobile phone while you're waiting for the metro. Or you're at home watching a television commercial comes on, you pick up your phone to check your email or something, and there's that same advertisement. And we kind of still have this debate, are these digital experiences? Are they traditional experiences? What are they? And the fact of the matter is that question is irrelevant. As marketers, our job is to connect with our consumers where they are. And so continuing to think of these things in silos and think of them separately uh, is just something, again, we need to change the way we think about it and move ahead. So as these tools have matured, and as you have heard uh, this morning, this question is no longer this idea that I know half my marketing budget is wasted, but I don't know how much longer I can keep ignoring the data that says which half. The tools are here, the, the ability is here to start to understand that. So uh, let me give you a little bit of, of the background here. Uh, I've been with Forrester uh, on and off since 1997. I left for a few years and then came back five years ago. And, uh, in my first uh, years there, I also covered marketing measurement. Uh, before there was the digital attribution tools, it was just offline uh, uh, tools, mainly market mix models. Um, and back then, the practices were nowhere near as mature as they are. And so those models were built maybe once a year, maybe twice a year. That was about it. Um, they were used very much as a post-campaign report, sort of backward looking. How did we do uh, in, that, uh, in that prior period? Used only then for vaguely you know, planning. How much money should I spend in television and newspapers and magazines and radio and so forth? Um, and only really, really you know, sophisticated uh, data analysts and data scientists would, would really understand uh, what those models were. But as we've seen over the years, technology, the basic technology story. Technology makes things better, faster, smarter, cheaper. So we now have real-time data. We have data at a very granular level of individuals and, and devices in use. And we've got more powerful analytic tools to pull it all together. And so these allow more frequent updates of the model as, as often as uh, monthly and weekly, I'm hearing, becoming more common. And it's no longer simply after the campaign is over does it tell us how we're doing because we're getting the data more real time. We can see while the campaign is running, is it working the way we expect? And if not, it'll give us uh, information about how to make it work better. We can also use it not only for that budget planning to get that initial allocation, but uh, then look within television or uh, display or search and find out which specific uh, elements are working and what can we do better. And as these tools uh, get more accessible, uh, this power is being put in the hands of the marketers so that they have much more direct access to it and that makes it, again, more practical to make these more ongoing changes. To it. 
Um, traditionally, we think about two techniques. We've talked a lot today about attribution, um, which is uh, typically a more uh, digital, it came from the digital world, using the cookie data, the individual data, and looking at that idea of optimizing uh, those campaigns on an, on an ongoing basis. The other uh, uh, companion tool is media mix modeling, which I alluded to before. Here it's using more aggregate level data. This is typically evolved uh, for uh, consumer package goods marketers doing a lot of television, and they're uh, using these models to tie what happens at the grocery store and what's selling at the grocery store to that television campaign where you don't get that kind of direct tracking that you get with, uh, with, with digital. Each of these techniques uh, has its strengths, each has its weaknesses. The media mix modeling doesn't give you a lot of specific guidance about, in, in television for example, which programs or which networks or which day parts should you advertise on. And uh, attribution uh, doesn't often take into account uh, the offline, uh, uh, the effects of the offline advertising or the effects of other factors like the economy or the weather that can be very influential on sales. And so a couple of years ago, uh, I, a colleague of mine who was focused on, a colleague Tina Moffat was focused on multi-touch attribution, I was covering mixed modeling separately. And we saw these two beginning to come together. And we saw the way that these two uh, techniques complement each other. And the strengths of one uh, help support the weaknesses of the other. So we combined our coverage areas into what we call unified marketing that brings together these techniques in a way that gives you a more effective way of looking at it. So again, mix, this mixed modeling idea gives you that big strategic view. Uh, how much money basically should I put into each of these different touch points? While multi-touch attribution allows you to look at specifically the placements that create the segments and how they're responding and give, gives you that opportunity to improve that level. So here's what a you know, typical deliverable out of a market mix model looks like. And you'll notice there that idea of base. Um, the idea of base volume is really important because what that says is that even in the absence of any advertising, a brand that's well known, that's been around for a while, is going to de deliver sales whether there's any advertising or not. And so that base should not be attributed to advertising. It needs to be kept separate. And then these models can break out uh, by channel how much of that incremental uh, uh, sales that are being driven by the advertising, how much each channel uh, delivers. And then that allows you to uh, think about, well, what if I change that proportion? What would happen? And so it gives you a tool to uh, um, predict how a different mix would improve your marketing effort. Now, multi-touch attribution, we've heard a lot about uh, last click. Last click is obsolete. Last click, I hate when people say last click attribution. The word attribution should not be used in the same sentence with last click. So please change that for me. Um, uh, you've heard a lot about why that is not effective and how it uh, uh, ignores the important effect of all the other channels. We know. The other one that has been very commonly used is just to randomly say, well, let's assign some percentage to all these different points, and we'll just do that. But that's problematic, because you're really just pulling numbers out of thin air. You don't really have any firm basis to believe it. Um, and so that's why doing this kind of sophisticated analysis, where you can really quantify that contribution by channel, gives you the most accurate way to know what is working, what's not, and make the smartest decisions on how to build your marketing plan because of that. And then when you use both of these together, you can answer these questions 
Uh, to get like which publishers and sites are driving the most conversions, which digital in interactions drove the most in-store sales, which campaign elements are most successful with which audiences. How would a shift of some money from television to email uh, affect sales? Um, how are competitive pressures impacting performance? And basically that really big question that we all have is where should I invest my next marketing dollar? There are so many you know, channels and touch points, and none of us have the budget that we'd like to have to be able to spend in all of those channels. So really knowing which ones are contributing, which ones aren't, how to eliminate some things that, that aren't uh, needed to deliver the results you need can really help you then be more effective with the channels that are important. And so that's why the world is moving to this idea that I alluded to of unified marketing, where you've got this combination of analytical tools with the richness of the data that allows you to look both from that top-down view of what should that overall mix be and how can I make sure I have the right amount of money spent in each of those channels, and then that bottom-up view of now that I'm in market, I'm seeing results come in, uh, how can I make sure I'm getting the most for my money by knowing exactly what's happening in the market and adjusting to conditions uh, as they are during the campaign. So our unified uh, measurement definition is this blend of statistical techniques that assigns business value to each element of the marketing mix at the strategic and tactical level. And here again, I want to stress business value. I talk to a lot of marketers, and you know, I, I work with them a lot still on uh, defining you know basic metrics about you know viewability. You know, an important metric to know. Uh, you know, impressions. How do you compare impressions to your media? Things that are important to know, but they're not answering the question about the business value, which I'm sure you're all pressured more and more by your uh, financial executives to say, if I'm going to give you marketing people all this money, you know, what are you going to give me for it? And that's the business value that these tools can help you uh, uh, justify and prove. And that's what's important. And with these tools, John Wanamaker's dream comes true. You can now identify which half of your advertising is wasted and eliminate it and move it to the places where it is going to be uh, uh, effective. And I think you've heard a little bit from some of the other folks here about the results they've gotten and how they've improved their marketing. Um, but let me add a couple of other points here. Um, this is a study from uh, a survey I did in conjunction with one of the Forrester Wave evaluations. Uh, these are evaluations of sets of vendors who provide a particular service. So uh, last fall, my colleague Tina Moffat and I did this analysis of 10 uh, companies in this marketing measurement space, of, again, the ones that are attempting to deliver this unified uh, model. And when we ask their clients, well, what is it you're really trying to do? What stands out for me uh, are those top two that, as you can see, are significantly higher than any of the others. Creating a data-driven approach to guide budgets between channels, tactics, and media placements, and a data-driven approach for strategic marketing investment. And I just went very quickly past my title, but my title was, you know, the data-driven future of marketing demands this kind of measurement. And we can see that, you know, marketers are really, you know, it's, I think it's taken us a while. And I'm, I'm, I've been around long enough. I was in the business before the internet came around, so that will age me. But uh, I, I think it was hard for marketers in a lot of, in a lot of ways to become warm up to data. But we're, you know, we're getting the profession is really maturing in that way. And so uh, it, it becomes more and more important to understand that. And when we ask them, well, what, to, what different channels, media, and touch points are you trying to measure with these models, you can see uh, that it's a you know, really balanced mix of traditional media and uh, digital media with uh, you know, an average here of 5.6 online channels, 9.9 .9 offline channels, so roughly 16 different uh, channels and media touch points 
that these models are helping them understand in a way that if you try to look at each of those separately, you're just not really going to understand the full uh, effect of, of that media plan. Um, and this is, I think, one of the most important changes that these tools bring to you. You can see here the number one uh, answer to this question, what specific actions have you taken based on your model's insights? Number one, we have run what-if scenarios to determine how we should increase future marketing spend by 5%. Again, these tools make it possible to move away from that idea of reporting on how a campaign performed in the past to looking forward to saying, now that we know how different channels work, how can we apply that knowledge to plan more effectively in the future? And that's one of the objections I also hear from people who aren't familiar with these tools, is these can be kind of expensive, and as you probably picked up, there's a lot of work that goes into getting the data together and getting people to uh, support an, an initiative like this. And you know, for people who don't understand this aspect of the tools, they go, geez, if all it's going to do is report on whether a past campaign is successful, you know, I'm not sure it's worth the time, effort, and money. But when you can say to them, that's only a piece of what these do, you know, the real value here can be using that uh, information, applying it forward, and in those times when uh, you know, the CFO comes by toward the end of the year and says, hey, I need to cut your budget 10%, because uh, you know, we need to make a bottom line number, you can use a tool like this to say, well, where can I cut that is going to uh, uh, hurt least and have the least impact on the results I'm trying to draw? And that gives us as marketers much more confidence that we're doing the right thing for our companies and for our brands. And for marketers that are using uh, these tools now, uh, they're becoming more and more common and once they you know, begin to get that experience, they apply it to more and more of their budget. Um, so you can see for 40% of the users of these models now, uh, they use the model to determine between 75% and 100% of their marketing budget. Another quarter between 50 and 74%. Um, so they're you know, really using these uh, on a lot of their spending. And they typically see a 10% increase. I've heard cases where they've seen upwards of 20, 25% increases, particularly when they first start out. And you find a lot of uh, opportunities to improve things. And then as you've been using it a few years, you've eliminated a lot of uh, that stuff that wasn't working before. You get down to this kind of 10% uh, uh, level, but it continues to uh, you know, deliver a lot of results. So hopefully after this morning and seeing some of this, uh, you are ready to go back to your organizations and lead change. But where do you start? I mean, as again, you've, you've heard these are big projects. They can be complicated, uh, expensive projects. And in talking with a lot of marketers who have uh, done this, the theme that I hear consistently is you know, start small. If you've never done this kind of modeling before, if you've never done this work before, if there's a lot of pushback in your organization, if there's a lot of uh, uncertainty in your organization and doubt about what these tools are and whether they should use them, start with you know, manageable pilot project where you can uh, you know, do things like assess how ready you are. What analytics capabilities do you have in your organization to help guide this project? Uh, what data do you have and how well is it organized? Um, because that's you know, a critical part of the success of these things. Um, I know if, uh, I, if I heard correctly, this theme of it's, it's not something marketing does alone came up. We need um, not only marketing and brand management, uh, but I've seen that often the business intelligence or the analytics team is a co-owner with marketing of these tools, and often finance is involved, because uh, finance can provide uh, some really good insight into what should you be measuring that the CFO and the CEO are really interested in, and if you can speak their language, they'll support this. Um, 
And if you have a team like that, and probably some of your IT uh, folks as well to help you get access to the data, um, that will help move the project ahead. And then find a particular product, or maybe a particular product manager who is interested and you know, curious and willing to roll up his or her sleeves uh, to, to do something new. Uh, and then define some key questions, not just, well, gee, how well is our marketing work? Maybe it's a question about, how does this combination of traditional and digital work, what's the best proportion? Or how does a particular segment respond to a particular uh, kind of offer uh, or a particular mix? And if you can define a, a key question like that, that, again, that the product manager for that uh, particular product I said, geez, if I only knew the answer to this question, I know I could really improve my results a lot. Keep it small, keep it narrow. Maybe do just, uh, you know, well, I, I've talked to a number of marketers who use these kinds of models on a global basis. You know, initially start with, you know, one country or a small region and work through that, gain that experience, start to evangelize and start to tell others about the success and then no further support in the organization for that. So I hope that's helpful. I hope that's a good wrap up for everything you've heard today. And I'm happy to take questions. Okay, thank you very much, Tim. Very interesting facts between us and the United States. How many companies, do you have some, some facts or something? How many companies in the United States percentage are at this moment with this kind of solution? Yeah. Group? Have this. Yeah. Can you say um, yeah. Sure. Sure. We've we've uh, done some a number of surveys on that, and what we see is about a third of companies Different. are are applying this today. There's another 15 to 20 percent who say they are you know planning to implement in the next you know 12 to 18 months. Mm -hmm. So now you get about 50 percent that either are doing it or are starting to do it, and then another 50 percent who is they just haven't started. Do you have the European facts? Because I would like to compare how much is, yeah. how much is in Europe. Yeah, in Europe. Yeah. I, I don't have facts. <coughs> yeah, so yeah we, we haven't done a similar study in Europe. Not, yeah. We don't know it, no? Yeah. yeah. Okay, well, let's to see the difference. No? Because you Americans always are before us in the States for and we come later. No? That's the only way. So we look at you to see what you're doing and, and then we the things, no? but I think it's, it's yeah. a, a, a good way you know, yeah. because it's too much money spending you know, for nothing. No? Yeah. At this moment, yeah. and it's the, the crisis we see in the advertising industry. No? I was last, last week in Cam Cam Lines, mm -hmm. Cam Lines, and we speak with Mark Pritchard, you know, the CEO of the field of Procter & Gamble. He was speaking about this uh, some months before, and it's, it's a problem. No? It's yeah. a problem the industry has with the, yeah. the transparency, the money is going to some places in the Online, oh, so we have to do something, no? I think it's what we think is no? Absolutely. And, and I think it's in the urgent, 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 in this moment. Yeah, think, no? yeah. yeah absolutely. Um, and, and that's where I think, again, when you look at that 50% in the US that is doing this, I feel like we're finally over that point where it's just kind of early adopters and fast followers. They're really, you know, really innovative companies. Clearly, they've been doing it. And particularly in the FMCG world, you know, these models, market mix models have been around for 20 plus years. Um, but we also see, you know, the other uh, big uh, industries that are using it now are retail and broadly technology that would include particularly things like telecom, uh, uh, cable and satellite television services, those kinds of services. Um, and then a smattering of you know, travel and hospitality, auto, etc. that are beginning to adopt it more and more. But I think you know, the, the good news there is for, for all of you is these things have been proven. There are a lot of companies using it. You're not bringing in something to your companies that is so on the cutting edge and it's so like brand new that it's really risky. Um, there's lots of these examples that you've heard a couple today. Companies are doing it, seeing success, and I think it's reaching that that point where enough companies are using it that that last you know, fifty percent in the U.S. they don't start doing it really quickly. They're going to really be losing to those 
uh, companies who are using it. So I think that will, again, drag in the classic sort of technology adoption story of the early adopters of fast followers and then the mainstream who starts being hurt because those companies are, you know, gaining market share and selling more than they are. They finally go, oh, we have to catch up with them. To do like, like that, like you in the States. Venga, preguntas en, en Spanish or in English for uh, Jim. Que ha venido en Boston para estar con nosotros o con nosotros. Somebody, alguna duda, question? Nobody? Sí, venga, Nacho, okay. ya que ha venido aquí, para explicar, <laughs> vamos a ser un poco polites. Pero claro, no. Jim, hola. Jim, one question. Um, uh, would be in your opinion the advantage for a for a for except for two clients in the same industry, one using attribution and the one and the other one not using anything. What would be in terms of um, competition the the advantage of having attribution model? Do you, yeah. do you think it would be a great advantage uh, for uh, the client using <laughs> attribution? Or yeah, if if you think about you know those those statistics I showed that the company, in that example, the one company using attribution will be between 10% and say 25% more effective with their marketing dollars. So let's say the two companies have, have similar budgets. The one using the attribution is going to get 10 to 25% more revenue than the other company, so probably stealing it from that. This is a, I mean, 20% uh, is a huge barrier for the, for the, uh, the other companies that use attribution. Yeah. Jim, uh, uh, any clue about uh, who are the main players uh, providing this kind of capabilities for our attribution in the market? Sure. Um, it, it, it's an interesting market because it's still pretty fragmented. Um, you know, again, the, the, the 10 vendors that we included in the wave, um, uh, most of them are US, pretty US centric. They might have an office in Europe. Um, uh, and then you've got here, you know, the folks at Neural One that are based here. Um, and all the companies are relatively small. There isn't like an Adobe of, of measurement yet. Um, Google has dabbled in it, um, but it's, it's a very small market and, you know, in, for the kind of scale that Google looks for in their products, I, I just, you know, I don't see them uh, really becoming a significant player uh, in this. Um, some of the companies that are a little more global are MMA, uh, uh, Marketing Management Analytics, which is owned by Ipsos uh, in France. Uh, so they've got, through the Ipsos offices, they've got more representation around, uh, uh, around uh, the world. Um, who else is more global? Um, AOL bought Convertro, um, and, has, and they've actually done a very good job of improving the Convertro product and turning it from a pure multi-touch attribution product to that more unified product. Uh, and so they're going to, I think, uh, become more global. Um, and uh, uh, those were those were a few to, to look at. Jim, what are the what are the, the main obstacles, the main problems in the, for the United States companies to implement this kind of attribution models from your perspective, not from your I think, problems? Yeah, I mean I think there are two. I, I think there's first of all inertia. Um, so, we, I, yeah, it's new, we've never done this before. We're used to measuring impressions and clicks and all these other things. So why should we change to this way. Um, lack of understanding of, of the, the mathematics and statistics, which can be you know, a little complicated. Um, but you know, again, as marketers, we don't need to be data scientists. You know, we need to make friends with the analytics uh, uh, colleagues in our organizations and get their help uh, to go you know, really deep and to you know, understand should we be using a Bayesian model? Should we be using a conometric model, et cetera, et cetera? 
you know, develop those relationships. But what we as marketers need to be able to say to them very clearly is, here's the business problem we're trying to, to answer. Um, and the more detailed, the more specific we can get about that, and not just, hey, I want to know how my marketing works, the better they'll be able to decide uh, on what is the right approach to that. So I think there are those kind of skills that we as marketers need to, to learn and new ways of thinking we need to learn. Um, you'll notice I didn't say technology is fair. Uh, there are a lot of great tools you know, out there. They're, they're getting better all the time. The data is probably the other big, big problem. Uh, I have not heard a single implementation where uh, at least the first three months, uh, well, two months, I think the fastest implementation I've heard is about eight weeks, uh, of just digging into, you know, once we know what questions we're trying to answer and what we're trying to find, then you define, you know, well, what data do we need in order to answer that question? And then you go look for that data and you find out, oh my goodness, it's scattered all over the organization. In this database, it's organized one way, and when we try to compare that to this other data we need in this other database, it's organized a completely different way. And so then you've got a sort of slide about cleaning up your data, that whole process uh, goes on. And again, as marketers, I think we're often in that bad habit of we live you know, campaign to campaign. So we've got these cycles of a couple months, three months at a time, and you know, then we're on to the next thing. And this is a project that's going to take nine months, 12 months, I've heard them go as long as 18 months if you know, it's a really big organization. And again, you've got real challenges getting the data together. And so having that discipline of, of seeing through a project like this step by step over that period of time, uh, you know, it's a little different. You have a question? Yeah. Thanks. Uh, hi, Jim. Thank you for being here and traveling from so far. Um, we've spoken about uh, revenues that an attribution model could uh, bring to our companies. Uh, you were talking about 10%, which sounds pretty sexy. Mm -hmm. um, whoever, what about the cost of uh, uh, implementing license, etc., for these kind of yeah. uh, solutions. Mm -hmm. And uh, I have a second question mm -hmm. uh, regarding what internal capabilities we should have within our company to be able to understand all the data that we're going to get and whether mm -hmm. it's interesting for a company with, let's say, moderate revenues and not uh, mm, data mm -hmm. analytics in house to have. Uh, um, a, an application like this. Yeah, all great questions. Okay. Uh, and if, if are any of your companies foresters, subscribers? Uh, I don't mean this to be a pitch, but uh, these are all questions that we we answer in Forester. We write these series of reports around an initiative like this that we call playbooks, and there are twelve chapters in a playbook that you know, help you uh, understand the vision of what's going on and it takes you through these kinds of questions of what's the business case, um, what is the roadmap that you need to implement things. Um, so it's, it's a really good resource for that. But let me answer your question. Um, again, in that wave evaluation you did, and now those 10 vendors, I, I'll qualify it, as saying they tend to be the higher end vendors. Um, so they're, you know, probably more expensive. There are some other options out there that might be a little less expensive, but you know, they, uh, uh, we asked them about what is their average annual contract value. And it tended to be between $300,000 and $500,000. And that included uh, you know, the modeling, the platform. It was kind of an all-in cost um, for using, using their services, some of their consulting services as well. Um, I have seen some other um, uh, 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 players out there who come in closer to $200,000. The $200,000 is about the floor. Um, and what I've also seen with companies, as I, as I was alluding to before, once you get through that pilot project, 
and you see how effective it is, and you start adding maybe other brands, if your company's a multi-brand company, or you start using it in broader geographies and other things, you start to invest more. But again, once you have that experience and you know how it works for you, you can scale that uh, in a way that, that, uh, that makes sense for your company. Um, in terms of the skills that you need in-house, uh, it, it's really, really helpful to have a good analytics partner. Um, because again, the math here is uh, 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 a little complicated. And while there's a lot of science in these models, there still is also a little bit of art. And whether you pick you know, the Bayesian model or the uh, neural net model, et cetera, et cetera, some of those things are judgment calls that your anal an analytics partner can really help you make. Your vendor can help you make them too. Um, but a lot of the companies I talk to, you know, they respect their vendors and they consider vendors often more partner than vendor. But they really like having that you know, internal person uh, to support them as well. Um, we do do, in, in this playbook, we do have a, a chapter that's all about organization. Um, and there, you know, we identify, uh, as, as I alluded to, you know, marketing, brand management, IT, finance, analytics, uh, there's probably you know, some other groups potentially, and not all of them will be as deeply involved, um, but some, particularly like IT, uh, you're going to want their help in getting access to data. You know, they're not going to be intimately involved in the model, but you want to be thinking about the role they play. And um, that's really an important thing to make sure that you've got uh, a clearly defined set of requirements from all those, those different kinds of partners as well. Did that answer your question? Yes, thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Jim, for being here with us. Thank you very much. At 9 o'clock, we can close the session. But very interesting. Thank you very much. Great, thank you.